Thank you. And now the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a draft agenda for tonight. Can I have a motion to approve? A motion. Christy? I'll second. Kelly Sport, all the people who are here and say aye. 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 Good. Uh, up first, we have uh, recognition tonight. Uh, I have the pri privilege of recognizing a significant achievement by one of our own. Trustee Reichenbach has earned the NASB Master Platinum Award, a distinction that reflects a high level of commitment to continuous learning. This accomplishment requires the completion of a series of courses and a significant investment of time and effort, including 19 advanced CDA classes and over 800 education credits. This award is a clear indication of Nick's dedication to continuously improving his ability to serve our community and our schools effectively. It's a commitment that benefits not just our board, but the entire district. So Nick, we congratulate you on this achievement. Thank you for your dedication to our students. We have a frameable <laughs> certificate and a nice fit from NASB. So. That usually comes with a banquet. <laughs> we'll, we'll schedule it. <laughs> All right, up next is our uh, consent and agenda items. We have three items, a fall coaches update, certified staff resignation, and presentation of bills in the amount of just under $16 million. Can I have a uh, motion to approve our consent agenda items? Okay. Kelly? Support. Nick, support. All in favor, raise your hands and aye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Uh, new business number one, certified staff and hire. Dr. Matthews. I'll turn to Dr. Corey Wilson. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I am really, really excited to be able to present a certified <laughs> staff new hire to you. And the reason that I am so very excited is because this is the first Grow Your Own candidate to make it through our district's Grow Your Own program. And he made it through at a time when a perfect vacancy lined up in our school district. So for those of you that don't know um, Seth Powell, He's been working for our district for a long time. He's served as our courier, where he brings things all around the district. And he took a chance on our Grow Your Own program a year and a half ago and said, you know, I went to school. I want to go back to school. I have a passion for students and physical education, and I would like to become a physical education teacher. And uh, through his hard work, he continued working, supporting his family. His wife, Lois, here with him tonight, too. And um, uh, an alignment of stars occurred. <laughs> and so it is my pleasure, Dr. Matthews, to recommend Seth Powell to uh, teach here in Rockford as our first GYO candidate to make it through our program. We are excited to, uh, to have uh, Seth here tonight, but also excited for this opportunity for Seth and uh, his family, but also excited for our district as well. And so uh, Seth's assignment, do we, can we reveal it? We can. Uh, Seth knows his assignment. I think Seth might say a couple words if you wanted to in a minute, but um, Seth is going to be a physical education teacher at Valley View Elementary School primarily, so he will be assigned there. Awesome. So we present that tonight for your approval. Thank you very much. Motion to approve. I move. Kelly, support. support. Uh, <laughs> uh, anything, anything else? Okay. All in favor, raise your hand say aye. 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 Thanks, everybody. And Seth, if you'd like to come to the podium there and uh, say a few words to the board. All right. Yes, I just want to say thanks to everyone, to the cabinet, for giving me this opportunity. And my family, Lo is here to represent them. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just super excited to be in my community with, with the kids and do what I love to do with them every day and, um, yeah, excited for this new journey, new chapter, and I just, um, appreciate the opportunity so much. So thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay, on to new business two, code of conduct. I'll turn to Mr. Ram. 
Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Um, each summer, the secondary administrators get together, kind of do a little reflection on the school year. Um, as you know, there's a student uh, handbook that kind of outlines some of the happenings of the school um, year, the schedule, some other information for students. Part of that is the secondary code of conduct. And the code of conduct outlines just some responses around certain types of uh, behavior. So secondary administrative team uh, gets together in the summer. They also attend some workshops. They network with uh, neighboring school districts and whatnot. And they uh, think a little bit about maybe some of the tweaks that would be made. So it's a great opportunity for them to look back and collaborate and hopefully be uh, a little bit more uh, responsive or targeted. Additionally, uh, as well as the uh, secondary code of conduct, um, consequences, if you will, our district firmly believes in the uh, restorative practices concept. So I want you to understand that while we're going to talk a little bit about, yeah, sure, you know, here are some tweaks to language or whatever the case is, in the end, we're about teaching. And so we really think about how we can um, help students and families when a decision occurs to maybe make a, a poor choice how we can make that a learning experience and support that student on the way back. So I have Eric Cavalli with me today, a member of the administrative team at uh, the Rockford High School. There were a couple uh, little tweaks that we talked about and I noted in the memo. Um, so Eric's gonna talk a little bit about that, be available for any questions that you have. And then the secondary code of conduct should be, uh, should uh, you approve it, will be posted online on the secondary buildings web pages. Okay, Eric. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Mr. Rand noted a couple of things that were in the memo. Added an academic uh, to the academic dishonesty category, artificial intelligence. It's a, it's a new thing uh, to give credit to our staff. Uh, they're working to educate themselves and get ahead of the curve and actually instruct our students on how to use artificial intelligence as a tool to help them in the production of their own work. However, there is a learning curve for students, and we're working on making sure they understand that artificially uh, produced work is not their own work. So that's a prohibition that's been added. Uh, dress code, uh, just inappropriate, you want to know. That it kind of speaks for itself, that's not something that we had. Um, I think a lot of the other changes that we made were kind of geared a little bit for customer service and, and trying to be uh, a little more open. Uh, we removed the limitation for college visits. We had a prohibition of no more than two. Um, we kind of decided that that's a, a family decision. I think if we felt that it was becoming excessive, that would be a conversation we'd have with the family. But historically, it's been a non-issue, so we decided to remove that. Um, we removed having excuse calls must be made before the student comes to school. Um, that's not always realistic for a family. And so uh, we just made an effort to, again, kind of a customer service orientation. If a family can call after work, that's fine. Um, remove loss of credit due to absence. Um, we work hard for students to succeed, and a lot of our students have difficulties in their lives. So we didn't want to add loss of credit on top of it. Typically, if we have a student struggling with attendance and earning credits, we're already working with them and their family. So that didn't make sense, so we removed that. <clears throat> and then finally, over-the-counter medications can be carried by students. Um, that's uh, new in school code. Um, typically, that's not something that we punish, but it was in the handbook. We just typically counsel parents and ask them to provide it to the school nurse. They can now carry them. Now, if it turns out that students were selling over-the-counter medications, you know, something like that, that would be handled differently. But the school code does actually allow them to carry over-the-counter medications. So we remove that from the handbook as well. So some notes, uh, of course, and I think the, the big concept is that we want to be um, reflective and really, as Eric kind of mentioned, you know, um, our goal is to obviously have some boundaries and have some clear expectations, but work with families. Um, and certainly, certain unique situations are always going to stand out as well, too. So with that, I maybe open it up for any questions that you have for Eric or me um, before I move forward. Yeah, I, yeah I, was, I was not taking any objection at all to the student focused items, those two. And I know as a district in the curriculum area, we're talking about how can AI mm -hmm. be taught and used so they can use it, they just can't present, probably have to sort, you know, uh, reference and those sorts of things. So I appreciate that, that this isn't a ban on AI, I just want to make sure, because that fits with what I think the curriculum group has talked about and I know we've talked about 
because um, there's no turning back in terms of, I think all of us in our professional lives have already run into it. Um, so I appreciate that. And I think the other changes for family flexibility, um, you know, I wish we would have done some of these a long time ago. Um, but these are, I don't find any objectionable items in these at all. It's a win for everyone because honestly, you know, some of our secretaries in the attendance office are having difficult conversations with parents saying, well, you didn't call in ahead of time. And it's like, you know, we, you know, we realize that that's not a, a sensible provision to maintain. People have very busy lives, um, and, and we can accommodate that. And it, it takes a burden off of the staff, and it also provides some flexibility for families. Makes sense. Anyone else? Um, I just wanted to kind of echo what Nick said. I, I, I'm in support of all those changes that are better for, for students. Um, and I also like that it's a clickable PDF. However, not all the links are clickable. Like I just, I could click on most of them, but then like some of them you couldn't click and bring it, bring, okay. and have it bring you to the, the right section. So. I think it's great that it's going to be online and that it's clickable. I would just have you go through those links and make sure they're all working. Fair. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? So, Mr. Ram, uh, when does the code of conduct come into play in the school? So, first of all, um, you know, we're going to talk with kids about onboarding during the year. Okay. And so, if we know that there are some conversations um, that have been routine, we've been, we're going to be proactive and say, no, these are topics that we've had discussions with um, with students in the past, and so student body at our beginning of the year meeting. Here are some you know um, expectations that we have, and so forth. Um, so we want to first of all try to be as proactive as possible. But secondly, if there is a situation that occurs, like for example, if a teacher remarks that a student has been um, academically dishonest in a class, or if there is a peer interaction uh, between two classmates that is not positive. There might be a referral that goes to uh, the main office, and then in the main office conversation typically involves a uh, coaching conversation with a student, a parent communication at any time that you, you know, meet with a student about maybe something uh, that could be potentially uh, a rule violation. And then there may or there may not be the use of the code of conduct, but that would be at the discretion of the administrator and in some instances a counselor or one of our behavioral uh, coaches and so forth. So, um, you know, it is not necessarily an absolute every single time there's some pieces that are a continuum by which you would use it. We also try to just provide a range um, for people to navigate some of those discussions. Every situation is not the same as and Trisha mentioned there's some flexibility you want to work with parents around certain pieces but running a high school is also a difficult job sometimes and there's uncertain behaviors or certain situations and so this the code of conduct does provide for that continuum of thinking around that I think support Mike a lot of our conversations you know with classroom infractions I, I use the expression bed fences and I'll ask kids to you know what that means and some do some don't but I'm like if you can go back and fix this on your own I'd recommend that, you know, again, just in an effort to help these kids grow up and manage themselves a little bit. Uh, in many instances, I would say in most instances, a lot of times those are resolved. So, but it is nice to have the handbook available. And we had a lot of conversations about how modern workplace is going to require a working knowledge of, of large language models, and AI is going to be a part of our, our students' future, and so our ability to help them learn how to use it thoughtfully uh, is going to be a remarkable skill set that they'll need. If the board were to be interested in some of the progress that we're making around um, responding to the advantages of the AI and helping our kids, I'd be happy to do a future report. We have a group that's working on that, um, and I think it's a topic that's out there enough that uh, for a late fall or something like that. Fantastic idea. Yeah. I'd also just you know, publicly say again that the restorative practices that the legislature forced or thrust upon us what was four or five years ago now, um, I was a huge, I discounted it. I thought it was going to have, you know, 10, 12 kids walking around the buildings that shouldn't be there. I, I, you know, I've said this before and I'll say it again. It's actually worked. You know, I've talked to the principals at the high school, you know, they, the Saturday school, some of the other restorative things. I think what it's done is it's 
made the line to cross very thin, but it's also made it, that is the line. There's these five things, you cross that line, you're gone. And I think it's been really good to see some of those students um, not come before the board. So, I, you know, I think it's actually working. I think, you know, if it doesn't work, we certainly hear about it at some point. But um, all in all, it's given a lot more flexibility, and I think parents should be thankful that it has gone that way because our hands aren't tied as a district in terms of what we do. So I, I like the fact that it's also becoming flexible down at the student code of conduct level as well. So um, all in all, a very good movement the last four or five years. Good. Okay. Anyone else? Good. Okay. Uh, so ready for motion? Yeah, motion to approve the <coughs> code of conduct. Kelly, in support. In support. Christy. All in favor, again, say aye. 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 Thanks, so, everybody. <coughs> uh, up next is our Fox Bright contract. Mm -hmm. We will turn to Allison Clements. As I'm sure uh, you and the board are aware, the district's website has been a topic of discussion for many years, particularly around its limitations and shortcomings and overall need for improvement. Um, and we continue to hear this message when receiving feedback from our stakeholders during our RAMS 12 survey results and also through the focus groups. Uh, so we have formed a committee. Uh, it's made up of district leadership, uh, operations technology, and our district's technology consultant, communication by design. Three website vendors were selected and interviewed by the committee. Those vendors were Foxbrite, Schoolblocks, and JCM. And all three of those vendors submitted proposals and bids for the project. Uh, to talk about the scope of the project, it includes the rockfordschools.org website only. So the scope does not include um, other district platforms such as Activate, which is where um, if you have an athlete, you do the Register My Athlete um, sign up. Doesn't include Family Access or Schoology, Rockford Public Schools Digital Sign Up, or Meal Magic that's used uh, by um, people that want to load money into their students' uh, food service account, just to name a few examples. Um, however, the website redesign will make um, these dis district platforms easily accessible on both a website version and a mobile device, which is very exciting, I think. Um, with the potential to deliver a new and custom website that represents the district and prioritizes a user-friendly mobile version, Foxbrite was identified as the leading contender. This decision holds the promise of a more engaging and accessible online platform for our state. The timeline for completion for the website rollover is for the rollover to take place over the holiday break um, coming up, so the 24-25 holiday break. Um, included in your board packet are the service and features, details, the terms and conditions, and the contract. The contract is a term of five years from January 1, 2025 through December 31st, 2030 and outlines a one-time fee of $45,699 with an annual cost of $13,998. The five-year term was advised by Communication by Design because it provides <coughs> a degree of consistency and it also aligns with um, our history of the models we've used in the past. So through the contract, Foxbrite would be engaged to build a custom website and mobile design and integration with ADA compliance services for our Rockford Schools Network website. The custom website would include a redesign of the look, presentation, and layout with mobile accessibility. The contract was reviewed by District Legal Counsel prior to bringing it to you today. The contract agreement features and terms um, are included in the packet, as I mentioned. So the recommendation is to approve the Fox Bright website contract in the amount of $45,699 for one-time fee and $13,998 annual fee to be paid for out of general fund. And this has been in discussion since I came to the district uh, two years ago, and, and so we're pleased that we can actually begin to move on this. And uh, there's been a lot of hard work by Lisa Jacobs and, and Allison uh, moving this forward, and so we're excited to be able to bring the conditions before this evening. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve the contract. Moved. Support. 
part. Any other questions? I, I just have one. I didn't see in the packet, um, is there available training for uh, that, that's simple, that it's probably video based, very short videos, whatever, for our parents and people using the website? I didn't notice anything around that area. I just want to make sure. Because it is a big change. I know strategically, we've talked about reducing email and driving people to a single place. And this is the place where we're going to drive folks. So I'm just curious about that. Because um, we should be leaning more on it. If we are and it's new, now's the time to shake the trees and make sure that people know how to get the apple off. Yeah, I believe that was discussed, but I might defer to Lisa mm -hmm. here just to give so, a more robust answer. Yes. So. The Although not outlined in the actual cost or the presentation of um, the line items um, for the website or the cost of the website, there will be um, definitely leading up to the launch date communication with parents and so on and staff um, of the upcoming rollover. And so uh, if there is a need for, for example, I think we launched a small short video previously regarding how to use the website and things like that. That definitely is part of that package. So all of those things with um, simple instructions leading up to the actual rollover has been discussed. Okay. So. I just have one. After sure. five years, I assume we still have the right to take all of our data on the website and, and move it someplace else if you want. Yes. To, correct? Yes. On to old business number one, special policy update, second for you, Dr. Matthews. So we'll turn to uh, Dr. Wilkel Crawford, uh, who leads our policy. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Matthews. Uh, this is the second time you will see the Title IX policy. This is a special policy update. We talked about it last month as well. Um, just to highlight a few things in the 2024 regulations that uh, were slated to take place on August 1st. Um, those regulations had some differences from previous Title IX regulations. They include things like complaints can now be verbal or in writing, not just um, uh, written as it has been in the past. Uh, there have been some changes to the definitions for sex-based harassment and some uh, really expansion of that. Uh, some verbiage changes as well, things like we used to call something a report, now we must refer to it as a notification. And there some things um, maybe like anecdotally that you would see in those. Um, we also, through the Title IX regulation changes, uh, the jurisdiction has increased from not just a school setting, but there could be certain off-campus settings where there might be an athletic code violation or where cyberbullying may take place after school in the evening, but then it comes into the school day the next day. And those were things that were previously gray and are no longer gray. And then the federal definition of sex would now include gender identity and sex characteristics, a difference from previous Title IX uh, regulations. So the last time Title IX was updated, it was in 2020. And now this update is a federal update for 2024. So you'll see two policies. Um, that's policy 2266 and policy 2264. Like we talked at our last month's meeting, um, what we have to run both of these policies in tandem because we may get complaints, or I'm sorry, notifications, uh, that were uh, for conduct that took place before August 1st, 2024. And we would have to use that policy for those. And then if we had uh, a notification of something that may have occurred after or on August 1st, 2024, we would have to sort those out by date and run those two policies. So uh, it's the recommendation that we would approve this so that we would be in line with the federal regulations. Uh, you may have noticed there are some things in the news around those regulations. We did talk about some of that at our policy meeting, which actually happened earlier than some of the other most recent things that have occurred um, from court challenges associated with um, these new Title IX regulations. I would remind the board that in Michigan, we do have to follow the Title IX regulations. Additionally, in Michigan, uh, we have the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, which has already defined gender identity as um, a protected class. And so we have that here as well. 
Uh, since our last board meeting, I haven't received any questions about Title IX um, or these changing regulations, but I'm happy to answer any ones that I could or um, get back to you if I can't. It is a complex and ever-changing world uh, around these kind of federal sex-protected regulations. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we'll start with a motion to approve the recommended uh, policy change second reading. So moved. Sure. Support. Kelly. Kelly. Uh, questions or discussion? Questions for Corey? Go ahead. Um, I just want to add that, you know, I, I feel like a lot of, well, at least some of the conversation and, and um, you know, comments that we heard at the last uh, board meeting um, had a lot of emphasis on how the new definition of sex includes um, gender and how that might have an impact on, on sports in schools. Um, but I think that that's just one of the things that this new policy um, has yet to, you know, we're, we haven't had any legal issues in Michigan up to this point. But that's not to say that there won't be any, and and the and the the fact that we're adopting this now puts us in line mm -hmm. with the um, the, re uh, the, um, the regulations that are um, already or the I'm sorry the definitions that are already in place um, through the of the uh, Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act, um, and so I think you know as Corey explained I think that there's there is a lot more to this policy change than just, you know, some of the emphasis that we that we heard about at the last meeting. And so I think that's important to take into consideration as we consider voting on this policy update. I just wanted to um, comment on the expansion into cyber and going into the cyberspaces, which are out of school. I think that we're calling them digital now. Aging myself by calling them cyberspaces. Yeah, the regulations call it cyberbullying, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, I just think that that's really wonderful. I, you know, we, we hear a lot, especially in media, about the challenges some of our you know, students face with, with bullying and, and especially the bullying that happens off the of school grounds and in digital spaces. And I just think that this is a really forward looking way to help protect our students, even when they're not on school property. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, to follow up on that, we've actually, you know, as a board, had to deal with some, and our hands would have been tied if that student had been doing it in the building, you know, during school hours. So I think, you know, in that sense, this is good. And the protections in Title IX, I don't have an objection with. I've supported them in the past. And I also support our administrators, our four administrators, led by Corey and Scott and a couple others that are tied and bound to implement these controls. And I saw that happen, ironically enough, or not, in 2020, happened to be an election year. 2024, we have this again, and it could go the other way. But you know, my, my point in to objecting to this is really those three words, and gender identity. And I know, I'm almost certain the board has the votes to do it. But I mentioned last month I'll be doing it, healthy voting, no. But really, I'm doing that as an opportunity to remind those staff members that are object to this, the community that objects to this, and certainly others, that our hands are tied in a lot of areas, um, and mainly because federal trumps state, and state trumps anything the board does um, in certain areas. And you know, I, I need to make sure that I mention to people that this is the case. If the federal government changes their minds, then Elliot Larson, which is our state protection, goes on hiatus because the feds trump the state. There are a lot of court cases going on in various federal districts. There are 28 states that have objected to this. There are a large number. I think this, you know, I mentioned it last time, this is going to change over and over. You're right, we haven't seen any issues yet, um, and, and I'm not looking forward to the day when we do, but the fact is, this is just my opportunity to remind everybody that the administration, the Title IX officers specifically are required to follow these regulations. The district is as well. Whether I like it or not, there's really not much that we can do as a board except to remind folks that state 
elections, federal elections, have an impact and have taken the right of the community district to decide many of these things. So that's my soapbox. That's why I'm voting no. I know we have the votes, and I know that Corey will do her job, and the administration will do what they have to do regardless. And so um, that's, that's my speech. I have something I'd like to say. Um, so LGBTQI plus is protected. I want to just pluck out, which Trisha mentioned when we brought up at the last board meeting, the, the T part of it. I just want to make sure that I am totally understanding and that our stakeholders totally understanding what we're voting for when we vote. Someone who was born with two X chromosomes versus someone that's born with an X and a Y chromosome. So the person that's born with a Y chromosome decides they're not comfortable with their gender identity and decides that they want to identify as a person with two X chromosomes are now allowed to play in female sports. Is that correct? Well, I, I can answer that. The NHSAA, the, the, uh, the athletic association that, that we belong to, has rules and, and they have uh, they, they decide that on a case-by-case -case basis. And so uh, they're I just, I can't imagine doing that, but I know that's what they're doing. It's, right. It's and, and, uh, and they have uh, allowed that at times, they have disallowed it. <clears throat> but they, the, the information goes to the MHSAA and, and they make a decision uh, based on the information that they receive. But that being said, if, if we as a board all vote to pass this, or a majority vote to pass this, we're giving it a lesson. Well, I think what we're giving a blessing to, and, and Dr. Wilson Crawford can, can uh, uh, chime in as well, is, is that uh, we are uh, giving a blessing to trying to protect the rights of everybody in our, in our district. And, and there are various points of view in our district, and, and what this Title IX does is to try to, tries to protect the rights of all of those individuals, uh, and, and in, in a way that that respects who they are and, and respects uh, who we are as a community. Yeah, I would just say that um, Title IX covers five things, um, and they're all harassment or discrimination-based things. Um, so, you know, I mean, I can share what those things are with you. Um, the, what you're referring to, uh, like the transgender community, um, you know, this would, they would have protections in the same five areas that other protected classes under Title IX would also have protections in. So you know, an example of that is disparate treatment, right? Like to be treated the same as other people, um, retaliation, uh, sex-based harassment, including assault, um, you know, disparate impact, like if we enact policies that discriminate against a specific group of people, um, including the transgender community or the LGBTQIA community, as you said. So that's what Title IX covers. I think most people think Title IX covers like sports. And um, the part of Title IX that covers sports is that disparate treatment part of Title IX. But Title IX is a lot bigger than that. Um, and that sports is just a really small part of it. But it is a part of it. Oh, it's definitely a part of it. Uh, it as far as whether or not disparate treatment or discriminatory <coughs> practices occurred in sports. Not just can I play sports or not, but did disparate or discriminatory practices occur based upon your gender while you were participating in sports. Not, it's not just like can you play sports or you know, can you not play sports. It has to do more with disparate or discriminatory conduct. I, so that's that's what Title IX is actually about. I would just, I would just finally say that I, I want to make it clear. I'm not lobbying the board to vote no. Okay, this is just a platform because, first of all, I, I don't agree that Rockford should be the test case in Michigan. Right? We've traditionally not been an activist board. I don't think we should be an activist board, just making a statement so that people understand that. And I don't believe the community, even those that contact me from a certain community all the time, 
I don't think they're willing for Rockford to be the lead white force with the sword fighting this in Michigan. So I just want to make that clear. I'm, I've, not, I've met with a couple folks individually on the board. I'm fairly comfortable. I know where they stand and where the board probably stands after we vote. Um, again, I'm not lobbying for Rockford to be the state of Michigan test case. This is just me reminding the public what we sit up here. I have a certification that says I've been through, and I know what I am supposed to be doing and those that are holding to all the way down here, the last level board. So I just want to make that clear. I don't think, Jared, you think I was lobbying the individuals to vote. No, that's not. No, I just want to so um, appreciate that and, and just to emphasize some things that I've heard and that, that stand out to me as I think about this. The question before us tonight is not whether or not we individually, personally agree with this clarification of the definition of gender. And so to vote in favor of a policy change doesn't indicate that each of us individually, personally agrees with the clarification of the definition of gender in the federal rule. That's not, that's not the question before us, and that's not what a yes vote would mean. Um, the question before us is, given the change in the definition of gender and the other changes in these regulations, what should our district policy be? Should our district policy align to those changes in regulation? Or should our district policies not align? And I don't think we ever want to be in a position where our district policies don't align with laws and regulations, federal, state, and so on, right? Because, why? Because that, I think, um, put, potentially puts us in a position where we are exposing ourselves to increased legal risk I think it puts our administrators and our staff in a precarious position where they know the law and are legally bound to follow it. And they will follow it even if our policy doesn't say so, because they have to, right? But we're putting them in a position where they, they know the law, they know they have to follow the law, but their district policy says something different. We don't want our administrators and our staff in that kind of precarious position. And so I think we have a responsibility uh, as, you know, duly elected, uh, trustees for a K-12 public school district uh, to do the right, we have fiduciary duty to, to abide by the law and our policies need to abide by the law and align to the law. To not do that, and, and I, I appreciate you know the, the, the points of view that have been shared, but to not do that, in my view, is a dereliction of that duty, of that responsibility. It, it's, it doesn't mean that we personally agree with whatever it is, it, it means that as a K-12 public school trustee, we understand that we have a responsibility uh, to make sure that our policy is aligned for those reasons. So for me, this this is a kind of a way up. I would just say one last thing. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. Anything else? Okay. I think we're ready. Um, uh, we motion and second already, right? right? Mm -hmm. All in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Okay. Uh, motion carries. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. On to the next one, Rams 12 update. Back, Max. I'm going to go up to the uh, computer here because we have a little presentation uh, for tonight. So, uh, tonight we come to the Board uh, of Education with the final version of our Rams 12 uh, strategic planning document. Uh, I'd like to thank our team, uh, especially Dr. Wilson Crawford, Mike Graham, Allison Clements, Lisa Jacobs and uh, a group that we call the organizers, uh, who are an administrative team that helped to kind of navigate through this. Um, uh, our administrators play a key role in, in helping get the survey out to the public, uh, uh, collect the data, run focus groups, and all those kinds of things. And so it was a, a big lift, but uh, they did a great job, and I'm very appreciative of that. Um, this document is a result of many months of, of hard work. We began talking about developing RAMS uh, 12 shortly after I arrived in Rockford. Uh, we became serious when we launched our, our work at the August uh, 2023 administrative retreat. The plan then moved forward with the launch of our RAMS 12 community survey in October. The link was posted on our district website. We sent a link to every family in our district. We sent a link to community groups, Rotary, the Rockford Chamber of Commerce, etc. And then we then proceeded over the next several months to work on crafting the document that would uh, reflect the community, parents, student, staff, and district partnership, tell our story, and identify how we would live into the future. Uh, the goal for RAMS 12 was reviewed with the board. It was to create an aspirational document 
that updated our vision and mission. It would emphasize our community vision for the students, uh, clearly identifying how our district would support the community's vision for who and what our students could become. We understood that the RAMS 12 document should reflect the vision of the board, our community, our staff, and importantly, our students. During the RAMS 12 process, we looked at desired priorities, uh, key strengths, main challenges, and key uh, outcomes. We began with an online survey. After the survey, we held focus groups with multiple uh, groups, parents, community members, staff, students. We gathered a broad cross-section of input. Uh, the online survey had over 3,000 individual responses, uh, and, and these reflect uh, uh, the groups that responded, parents and guardians of current students, parents and guardians of former students, community owners, staff members, business owners and workers, uh, former graduates, and uh, current uh, students. We spent weeks uh, kind of analyzing uh, the data that uh, was collected from these uh, surveys, and the priority for our district is our students, and everything we do should support achieving what our community, parents, staff, and students said were the clear outcomes they desired. Uh, we call these things the portrait of a graduate, a critical thinker, academically proficient, socially and emotionally aware, personally responsible, career and college ready, problem solver, and effective uh, communicator. Our new vision statement captures our desired outcome, what we wish to become, where we see ourselves in the future. It states the Rockford Public Schools will be a community of educational excellence, where students are challenged to think critically, act compassionately, and succeed boldly. Our vision statement calls us forth as a district and community create this place, a place of educational excellence. The mission statement identifies how we will live into our, our vision. The Rockford Public Schools is committed to fostering a rigorous and cohesive learning environment that challenges and supports each student, equipping them for success now and in the future. The key words in this mission statement point the way forward, the Rockford Public Schools. We must work together as a community to achieve our vision. Parents, students, staff, community members must come together to continue building our district. Student, our main focus is on our students. They are the reason we exist. All of our efforts are focused on helping our students learn, act compassionately, and succeed boldly. In a cohesive learning environment, we must create a system, an organization that works together. When one part of the system is out of balance, it impacts the whole system. The board and the administration, the administration and the teachers, the teachers and the students, the staff and the parents, the community and the district. All must work together to support our students. Cohesive was intentionally selected to identify how we must be united and working together effectively if we are to live in to our vision. To achieve this mission that will allow us to live into our vision, we need action steps. We define these as pillars and priorities. We have identified five pillars. These pillars form the foundation of our work. Academic excellence, wellness and preparedness, social responsibility and community engagement, collaborative culture, and organizational effectiveness. Each pillar comes with its own set of priorities. <coughs> The priorities identify the steps that must be made to ensure that the pillar remains strong and that we can achieve uh, the call of the pillar. Academic excellence has five priorities, or four priorities. High quality instruction, career and college readiness, post-secondary preparedness, critical thinking, and diverse offerings. Under each of these priorities, specific action steps will be developed. The pillar wellness and preparedness, the priorities uh, will be student well-being, employability skills, safety, and security. Social uh, responsibility and community engagement. The priorities will be global citizenship, equity, civic engagement, and community involvement. The pillar uh, collaborative culture has as priorities investment in the staff, strong partnerships, and belonging. And the pillar organizational effectiveness as operational sustainability, 
user-friendly experiences, and facility enhancement. We summarize the new RANS 12 with these four words. Learn, connect, contribute, and succeed. We believe that these words capture the essence of RAMS 12. Learn. Students, staff, parents, and community members must be lifelong learners. Connect. We create a community. The community is composed of students, parents, community members, staff. Each has an important role to play. Each is a partner. Each is to be respected. Each is to be honored and supported as we seek to ensure that all learn. Contribute. Everyone has something to contribute to the success of our district. We must find ways to allow the contribution of each so that all may succeed. Ultimately, our district will be judged by the success of our students. But our parents, our staff, our community needs to succeed as well if our students are to succeed. Grants 12 lays out the vision, mission, and pillars of the Rockford Public Schools. Create goals and action plans within the pillars and priorities. We're asking the board to approve this this evening. And uh, within each of those uh, pillars and priorities, we will develop action plans. Those action plans uh, will not be achieved all at once. Uh, we will focus uh, over the next three years on ensuring that we uh, address each of those uh, pillars and priorities. Uh, and we already talked at our administrative retreat how we might do that if the board approves this tonight. We will continue to communicate to our community. We will ensure organizational alignment, and we will enlist our community, parents, community members, staff, and students to live into our vision and mission. So we come tonight to ask your approval uh, for RAMS 12 as our next strategic plan. And our responsibility is to ensure that the board is aware of the specific action steps that we will take to ensure that we will fulfill the calling of RAMS 12. So that's our recommendation this evening. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Uh, so with that, I need a motion to approve Graham as well. Kelly, can you support? Christy, you there with support? All right, uh, questions or discussion? I just want to yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that this community engagement numbers are remarkable. I, I still cannot believe that more than 33,000 individual responses came in. But also, very importantly to me, I thought one of the numbers that was just so important was 457 current students. And I think that your voice is such an important part of, of how we think about the future of our district and to see that kind of student engagement is, is remarkable. Um, but also the highlight around um, opportunities for parents to contribute. And as a parent of a current student, I see my role as a parent um, throughout the Rams 12 and, and I'm excited for the opportunity to engage and connect and, and help contribute to a cohesive learning environment. Um, I love that cohesive piece and how it builds on our PLCs and, and the hard work we've been doing in curriculum all of these years. And I just think that RAMS 12 is a reflection of our community and um, I'm, I'm delighted. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to point out that I think we, when we sat down and had a discussion about RAMS 12, I think we had a really good um, discussion around the things that were important that we could measure and we could be, you know, hold accountable to and then we were really kind of preparing our students to become um, better stewards when they go on to college and graduate so they can participate in the community in the way that we need them to. So I think we really got a good action plan. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chrissy. Anyone else? Thank you, Fred. Yeah, I, you know, I, I went through the survey data, um, did a deep dive and it just shows the excellent, the, the output shows a lot of excellent work. Um, I was surprised Kelly didn't mention it. It actually looks really, really good, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it looks really good. Um, it's beautifully I, designed. Yeah, and, and then going through a lot of the, the, the detailed responses, um, we've done an excellent job of addressing critical thinking, um, which over the last three, um, that I've been a part of, of these critical thinking has been like one of the number one responses, which you can see from the summary data that I think Mr. Ram showed the top 10 responses. We've done a lot of excellent work. Um, I have talked to Dr. Matthews over the last several months, and I know um, I've introduced Jared to some of my thoughts. I think we've addressed a lot of the things that are in there. I think there have been, in my opinion, some oversight on some of the data responses. 
Um, I also think it was a missed opportunity to have the board involved beforehand to talk about or at least help generate maybe some questions that we might, as a, you know, we have our, we all have our sphere of community that we sort of hear from or know or live in or um, live near. Um, and I think we missed that opportunity this go round. With all that said, I think, you know, um, if one does a deep dive, they'll see many of the actual responses are addressed. We've been pretty good at the district of doing that, and I think this one also does it again. Um, Likewise, Jared and Dr. Matthews have my um, feedback on the way it should go three years from now, or not the way it should go, but, you know, again, I said it was a missed opportunity. I think maybe an oversight on certain um, topical themes that, you know, we don't really talk about uh, here at the board table. But, again, I, I think, um, again, excellent work. I know this is, this is moving a lot of dirt to get this done. Um, but that's just on the front end. Now to make things pretty, there's a whole bunch of detailed expert contractors, i.e. educators, at a lower level that have to construct this thing. And I know there's a lot of work ahead. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think that's the same sentiment because I asked for the, the, the same data and did sort through it a while. And yes, we did. We did answer a lot of these things here. There was a lot of data there. Mm -hmm. and some of it's being addressed already. The website update is such a huge, like, clearly that came through, and we were responding already, and that's remarkable to see. Yeah, I'll just add, uh, from my perspective, um, I was thrilled when I saw the, the draft. I, I think it looks great, but as I went through the content of it, uh, I just felt like it, um, I was just kind of blown away uh, at how comprehensive and, and holistic it is. Um, you know, as a parent with kids in school, I, it, for me, it, it's all the things that I would want my kids to, uh, it's, the, it's a type of system uh, and the type of vision that I want my kids to be a part of, which they can be a part of. So I was, I was thrilled with it, but specifically, there have been some comments about kind of the process and the data. I, I thought the process was, I thought the, the work was done exactly as it was articulated it was gonna be done, and I was comfortable with that from the start. Um, uh, it's you know been mentioned the volume of feedback, so it's, it was a comprehensive and inclusive uh, kind of approach. Um, I, I've, I have felt like we've had ample opportunity to provide input and feedback on both the approach going back to last October when it was laid out for us in our October meeting, up until uh, June when we saw the draft, and since then the series of small group discussions that happened where we had opportunity to really kind of deep dive and provide the input and feedback. And I know um, changes were made as a result of those uh, sessions, up to and including you know early last week, I think, when we were still doing that work. So I appreciate everybody's engagement on that. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I struggle to see where, you know, pre, preconceiving pillars would be helpful in a survey. I kind of prefer the approach that was taken where we ask the community and see what comes out as opposed to kind of leading the witness, you know, based on um, who I might talk to. Um, that's just my, my take. Um, I think it builds on our strengths, you know, Ram's strategic plan is not new, we've had it in place for a long time, and so it builds on that foundation and kind of continues uh, positively, but it does so, in a, and I think uh, it's, a, it, it, it's really been elevated, I feel like, to, to a whole new thing, and I think, I think the community is going to be excited to see it, very proud of it. Um, we'll get feedback along the way, uh, so there's a, it, it outlines continuous improvement and next steps as far as ongoing engagement, Dr. Matthew spoke to that, so I thought that was an important piece as well. So that's, I think those are, those are my notes. So if the board approves this this evening, we would uh, uh, create our final version. We would uh, get that into the hands of our community through mailing it out. Uh, also put it on our district website. Uh, and we would uh, create opportunities for our community to offer insight and also ways to continue to be involved so that we can uh, work collaborative, collaboratively together to build the community that we want our students to be in and we want our students to achieve in. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, we moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor, raise your hands to add. Aye. 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 That's everybody. Thank you very much. Um, this is a significant milestone, uh, so I just want to take a moment uh, on behalf of the entire board uh, to express our deep gratitude and excitement following the approval of the plan. Uh, as we've said, it's a, a collective effort, draws on the voices and insights of our entire community. Uh, we're thrilled to take this forward. As Nick said, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work that's going to happen here following up. 
Um, this will guide us going forward. Um, it embodies our vision now for excellence and our commitment to supporting all students as they move forward. So thank you, Dr. Matthews, Dr. Crawford, Raymond Clements, uh, Jacobs. Uh, I know the list is long, but we be deeply appreciative of uh, the amount of work that has gone into this over the last more than a year now, I think. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, moving on then to committee reports. Does anybody have any committee activity they want to share? I don't think so. But, okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. Um, so we're in the visitors. Uh, just briefly want to outline the guidelines for public comment. Uh, first and foremost, we value and welcome your input and feedback. We believe a collaborative relationship between our schools and the Rockford community is essential to achieving our shared goals. Public comment is intended to give the community an opportunity to address the board on issues in the Rockford Public Schools at our meetings. The board and individual members will not directly respond to comments or questions that arise, uh, but may follow up through the superintendent. We ask that you limit your comments to three minutes so everyone has an equal chance to express their views. Please be respectful and avoid using inappropriate language or engaging in personal attacks. We want to create an environment where everyone feels comfortable expressing their opinions without fear of retribution or harassment. To ensure due process and respect for individual rights, the district maintains a formal process for handling complaints against individuals. If you have a problem involving an individual or a specific incident, we encourage you to consider addressing it through administrative channels by contacting the superintendent's office. We ask that speakers express themselves in a civil manner with due respect for the dignity and privacy of others who may be affected by your comments. While it's not our intent to stifle public comments, speakers should be aware that if your statements violate the rights of others, under the law of defamation or invasion of privacy, you will be held legally responsible. If you are unsure of the legal ramifications of what you're about to say, we urge you to consult first with your legal advisor. We encourage you to provide constructive feedback and suggestions for improvement, which helps us improve our schools and better serve our students, families, and community. We thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts. We look forward to working together to ensure our schools continue to be a source of pride for our community. Lastly, please remember that public comment in our meetings is one way we hear feedback from the community. It is not the only way. Those who prefer other means to communicate often do so via email through the district website or by calling the superintendent's office. When I call your name, please step up to the podium. Uh, be mindful of the timer. Uh, please just address the board, not the audience or others in attendance, and, and the audience is asked to remain quiet so speakers can be heard without interruption. With that, we have uh, two folks signed up tonight, uh, starting with Charlie Curtis. Good evening. I, I can't tell you how grieved I am that you voted on the Title IX situation. Uh, to me, it is so wrong headed, so wrong. It, it, it uh, puts women and girls in jeopardy. It takes away their rights and it because of fear of, of a legal situation, you are put, I believe you're putting the young girls and the young women in Rockford schools at risk. I don't know if you've seen the Olympics where a transgender male about killed some gal uh, that, that was um, in, in the Olympics. And it was so unfair. What, what, it turns Title IX on its head completely. And it gives, it gives rights to men that women uh, deserve. It takes away, um, you know, their ability to excel in their sport, to uh, basically uh, be safe in their sport. And it, this is a, to me, this is a very serious thing, and it, and it absolutely turns Title IX on its head. And what, it, and, and to make that decision based on the fear of what is going to happen to you versus the safety and the, and the rights of young women in the Rockford School District to me is just totally wrong. Um, the, the, I don't know, I don't, think, I don't think that parents were informed of this vote. I don't know that for a fact, but I doubt that parents especially with girls that are on athletic teams, have been informed of this vote. They don't know what you voted on. They don't know that you took their rights away. They don't know that you gave, that you gave their rights to biological males. And this is insanity 
to believe that men can become women. It, it's, ju it's just insanity. The, the, the DNA, the chromosomes, there's no scientific basis for this decision. It's totally anti-scientific. It defeats the purpose of even teaching science in Rockford Public Schools. And, it's, and basically, uh, to, to, to believe that men can become women, in my opinion, is, is, a, is a, a form of insanity and that we've degenerated into this condition where we're, we're going against women rather than going for women. And, and in my opinion, uh, I think you're going to come to, re, you know, to, there's a, by the way, there's a hundred schools in Michigan that don't have to file the, follow this new uh, Title IX conditions. There's a hundred schools. They have, the, the, they have Time's up, sir. religious uh, exemptions, from it, so that was not correct.
welcome in those buildings. They won't know all the time and effort that has come, uh, gone into ensuring that they would have that great environment to walk into. So I'd like to thank our, our teachers, especially, for all the work that they give uh, to supporting our students. And that's my report this evening. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. And with that, we're adjourned. <coughs>